Unhappiness, irritation, insecurity, and well-being are not only things that happen in our minds. We usually think that our emotions depend entirely on our brain, however, it is our body that sends all the signals to the brain. It is the body who feels. So, an irritated gut may lead to an irritated mental state. And when we are under stress or we are feeling worried, we may lose our appetite, isn't it? We may even have some problems digesting food. Somebody who is going to give a speech in front of a very large crowd for the first time may feel so nervous to the point of throwing up. And the truth is that our intestine is just as important as our heart or brain. Unfortunately, most of the times, the gut does not receive the same care and attention as these other parts. On the contrary, we may even feel a little bit ashamed of it because of the flatulence it produces. So we kind of neglect this essential part of our digestive system. In the book Gut, the inside story of our body's most underrated organ, Julia Anders presents us with an exciting introduction to the intestine, or gut, and shows some recent research on that topic. Would you like to know a little bit more about this book? I am Sei Charata from Not Too Good, and I'm here to present you a detailed summary of this book. You will learn how to deal with common digestive problems such as reflux, constipation, indigestion, nausea. We also will talk about the slightly disgusting topics such as the quality of your feces, the structure of your guts, and the importance of the bacteria living inside of you and how you can have a better quality of life by taking certain probiotics and prebiotics. You will also learn about the role of bacteria in obesity. Attention, this content is provided with your agreement and understanding that it is only for information purposes and is not a medical service, nutritional service, or any other regulated service or a service that requires personal care and individualization. By proceeding, you agree to be fully responsible to have consultancy with the professionals of your trust and jurisdiction before making any decision. The ideas presented here may not be adequate to all individuals or specific situations. Anecdotes and case studies have a low hierarchical value in evidence-based medicine and are merely for illustration purposes. Each person is unique and accordingly there is no guarantee or promise for specific results. This material is only a subjective interpretation summarizing the reference material and does not represent endorsement to any information. It is not the intention of this material to criticize the original reference work. This summary is not official, not approved, not licensed, nor in any manner related to the original reference source. If you are interested, check the affiliate links to have access to the sources and deepen your knowledge and also to support the original authors. The Not Good Initiative welcomes you for also valuing education and valuing the qualified professional support to make conscious choices. What you need to know about feces. Be careful not to hold your poop for too long. When you hold your urge to go to the toilet, you are basically disrupting the good communication between the internal and external sphincters. And this is essential to be able to evacuate adequately. Without this coordination between both sphincters, problems like constipation may arise. And that is why some gastroenterologists recommend biofeedback therapy. Besides constipation, hemorrhoids and diverticulitis are common problems in countries where the toilet pot is used. But what is the problem with the toilet? Well, because of its shape, we have to be in a sitting position, and in this position, we have a lot of pressure applied to the end of the intestine. And when we compare with what happens in countries in which people do the squatting position to defecate, differently from countries where people use the toilet, we see that these populations show very low rates of hemorrhoids or diverticulitis problems. That does not mean that you should remove your toilet pot and make a hole in the ground. You can just make a different position. Just bend your body slightly forward and raise your knees. That way there is less pressure on your intestines and the feces are able to come out more easily. Another way you can take a look at your digestive system is taking a look at the color of your feces. Light brown or yellow might be a signal of Joubert syndrome. In these cases, the enzymes involved in blood processes act only at 30% of their normal capacity, so there is less pigment available for the intestine, and this disease affects around 8% of the world population. It's a relatively common disorder, and although the unusual color of the feces is not harmful by itself, this disorder can also cause fatigue and give the skin tone a little bit of a yellow shade. Yellow feces may also be due to certain bacteria living in the intestine as a result of antibiotics or diarrhea. Light brown or gray. A lack of communication between the liver and the intestine may cause this unusual pigmentation of the feces. In order to keep your body functioning properly, all the systems have to be connected with each other and 
This color may be a signal that you may go to see a doctor. Black or red, clotted blood turns black, and fresh blood is red. So if you have hemorrhoids, it is somehow normal to produce some red feces from time to time. But if it is very intense red, you should see a doctor. Now let's talk about the consistency. A healthy digestive system produces sausage-shaped feces. They may or may not have some cracks on the surface, or they can also have a very smooth and soft appearance. If your feces come out hard as little balls or lumps, that is a sign of constipation. The food is just taking too long to go through your intestines. Healthy feces take a little bit of time to go to the bottom of your toilet pot. If they're sinking too fast, this may indicate that some nutrients have not been digested properly. The feces that take some time to sink, they contain more gas, and this gas is produced by gut bacteria, which means you have a healthy gut. The mouth, gateway to the gut. There are many bacteria living in the mouth, and when the bacteria population goes out of control, this can cause bad breath problems or even immunological problems due to the tonsils. The digestive tract begins in the mouth. The mouth contains more nerve endings than any other part of the body, and this is why even the smallest piece of food that is stuck between our teeth can be very annoying. And we really hate when we accidentally bite a grain of sand from our salad or a piece of eggshell in our omelette. Saliva is a substance that makes the mouth very special. It is basically filtered blood, because the salivary glands are filtering out the red cells from the blood, keeping them inside of the arteries, and only allowing the transparent fluid through, along with calcium, hormones, and other substances. But why is saliva so important? Among the different components of saliva, there is also a powerful analgesic and antidepressant, even stronger than morphine. This is called opiorphin. This substance was discovered recently in 2006. So, on the one hand, the mouth is very sensitive, but on the other, saliva helps us to reduce the pain thanks to this analgesic effect. For example, when you uh, produce more saliva when you're eating, you may uh, feel your sore throat be hurting a little bit less after you have lunch. There has also been a little bit of discussion whether the act of chewing gum can boost analgesic and also antidepressant effects because of production of more saliva. This is a research still going on. But we do know that a decrease in the production of saliva while we sleep also has some effects. For example, bad breath and a slightly more sore throat in the morning. Saliva keeps our mouth clean. So bacteria will be multiplying when we are sleeping because there will be less saliva produced. And that is why you should brush your teeth every night before going to sleep. But you shouldn't worry too much about the bacteria in your mouth. That is completely normal. What you want is to avoid an imbalance. Brushing your teeth properly and also doing some tongue scraping will be enough for that. But there is something that requires extra care. Your tonsils. Because of the position at the back of the mouth, they are the perfect hiding place for bacteria to multiply and be kept away from the cleaning action of saliva. So, if you have bad breath and you can't get rid of it, maybe one idea is to take a look at your tonsils. Just take a look or ask somebody to inspect closely and if you, with a mirror or your friend, sees some white little dots in the back side of your mouth, this is the accumulation of bacteria that is causing bad breath. You may try to remove it by yourself, but there is a risk you will get hurt. So it's much better if you visit a specialized physician to remove it safely. And then you will notice how your bad breath will disappear basically immediately. Just don't get angry at your tonsils, they are a very important part of your immune system. Tonsils not only help to prevent colds, but they also contribute to keeping your heart healthy and also controlling your weight. It has been observed by removing the tonsils of young children before the age of seven that they increase the risk of obesity. Doctors and researchers are still trying to figure out what happens and there is a growing interest in science to understand the relationship between the immune system and weight.
Let's now talk about tonsil removal surgery. Just like any other surgery, this is something that is performed when it's quite clear that the benefits are greater than the risks. Removing the tonsils can help patients who suffer from psoriasis. Psoriasis is an autoimmune disease which causes these red, itchy, scale patches of skin, usually in the region of the head, along with joint pain and inflammation. Psoriasis patients are also vulnerable to sore throats. So one possible explanation is that the bacteria that hide in the tonsils for a long time are able to affect the immune system. In most of these cases, an improvement in the health of the patient is seen after removing those tonsils. The structure of the gut. There are some symptoms that indicate that we need to make some changes in our lifestyle to improve our health and our quality of life. For example, whenever you're having trouble swallowing, when you are becoming overweight, if you have some swellings in your joints, and if you're spitting blood. These are all signs that there is something wrong with the body, and we may be interested to find what is the cause behind it. And to do that, you have to first understand the structure of your gut. Maybe when you were at school and you had those basic anatomy lessons, you would be asking yourself, like, why do I have to learn all of this? Well, if you were paying attention to your anatomy classes, maybe you would be able to burp better. If you look at the picture of the digestive system, you will notice how your stomach is not straight. It is rotated to the left. So, if you're lying down on your side, or particularly on your left side, you would be lying on your stomach, and in this position, gases flow much better than if you'd be doing the opposite, lying on your right side. Burping is a mechanism that the body uses to keep itself healthy. Just put aside the ideas that we have about bad manners. Let's take a look at this from a biological function. In extreme cases, you could be suffering from Rowan Held Syndrome, which happens when a high amount of gas in your stomach is not being released through the mouth. And then this creates pressure against the heart and your bowels. And this may cause discomfort, dizziness, pain and difficulty to breathe. And then you feel a pain in your chest, as if you were getting a heart attack. In the past, raw health syndrome people would be believed to just be having some psychological, uh, unexplicable symptoms. And in these cases, it would be better for the doctors just to, instead of saying, well, this is psychological, just ask, have you tried to burp recently? Maybe it will help you. And also avoid alcohol, which causes these gas-producing bacteria to multiply. The same logic applies when somebody is having reflux. And when you keep your body straight, sitting straight, standing up, your esophagus stretches up and you can reduce the effects of reflux after a meal. Reflux occurs when gastric acid and digestive enzymes are regurgitated, causing discomfort in the throat. In some cases, this acid mix does not really reach the throat, but instead causes a burn sensation in the chest. When the nerves of the digestive system are receiving incorrect information from the brain, they may cause these gastric juices to go to the wrong direction. So, for reflux, what we want is to align the nervous systems in the brain and also in the digestive system. One tip for that is to be chewing gum to drink tea in small sips, and also to try relaxing techniques. If you are a smoker, quitting smoking also helps because smoking tends to stimulate some brain areas related to eating, causing a certain feeling about eating, but actually, since there is no food arriving, this will confuse your brain to produce gastric juices basically for no reason. Some doctors are recommending to avoid foods also that have some type of effect on your nervous system, such as chocolate, spicy food, alcohol, candy, and coffee. Another example of an importance of keeping harmony between all your nervous systems is when you start, for example, to feel dizzy when you're reading in a car or in a bus, because you're gonna have this so-called motion sickness. Your eyes will not perceive any movement because your eyes are focused on the book that you're trying to read. However, your movement sensors in your ears will tell there is a lot of movement going on. In this case, you have another type of contradiction. Your eyes are sending one type of signal, your ears are sending a different signal, your brain becomes confused and starts to believe it has been poisoned. So, your body's natural reaction is to try to throw up to get rid of that imaginary poison that you could be 
having. So one way to understand all these elements is that when you're having reflux, this could be a result of confusion by the information in your brain and information in your stomach. Not necessarily always because of high acidity levels in your stomach. That is why the use of antiacids are not always the best option. Taking antiacids for too long, for many weeks, can create long-term problems because the stomach will try to regain its natural acidity. And that is why antiacids are not really a good long-term solution for reflux or gastritis. Let's keep exploring the different parts of our digestive system. When your stomach expands because you ate something, that expansion will reduce your feelings of hunger. In the small intestine, an intensive process of food absorption is taking place, and this creates a sensation of fatigue. There was a myth that during digestion, all the blood from your head would go to your bowels, but that's not really true, because if you wouldn't have blood in your head, you would certainly die. So there are different hypotheses about why we feel tired after eating, and one idea is that we have some type of a messenger chemical from this gut going to the areas in the brain that are responsible for fatigue. And all of that will help your small intestine to do the job. The large intestine is where most of your bacteria live in your gut. This bacteria will help you in the final stage of digestion. People think that the appendix is a little bit useless, but the appendix is made of the same immunological tissue as the tonsils. The appendix is slightly separated from the other digestive processes, but it is close enough to keep an eye on the microbes. It provides a very good home for the good bacteria, and it will also be helping us to attack the bacteria that are considered to be harmful. This is a quite recent discovery from 2007, and everything that has been absorbed by our small intestine and our large intestines will be taken to the liver for inspection. However, the very last inches of the large intestine do not really send blood to the filtering system of the liver. Instead of that, the blood will go directly to the circulatory system. And that is why some people use suppositories. Suppositories contain less medicine than a pill and they act much faster. See, when you're using syrups and pills and tablets, all of these need to have a large dose of chemicals because most of it will be absorbed by the liver. Suppositories, on the contrary, they will bypass the liver and they act faster without overloading the liver. That is particularly good for small children and also for old people. Obesity and good nutrition. There are different theories of how bacteria can cause obesity. Each person has a different gut flora. Some bacteria are extremely effective in digesting carbohydrates. So, imagine somebody with an excess of these bacteria. That means that that person is going to be extremely effective to get all energy from that carbohydrate. Other people then will be a little bit less likely to gain weight eating the same type of food. And the bacteria have all different types of preferences. When you look at 100 calories from chocolate, that can be worse than the same 100 calories, however, from a banana. The carbohydrates found in plants and fruits and vegetables will receive less attention from those bacteria. Another theory suggests that obesity is related to inflammation. Patients with metabolic problems, obesity and diabetes generally have very high levels of infection. When our body detects harmful bacteria, the response of the body is inflammation on the infected area. And when the population of bacteria is kept under control, they are under a mucous membrane and there is no inflammation. However, when bacteria break out of control, they get in touch with other parts of our body, our body detects it and reacts through inflammation. This rarely turns into a serious infection. It's just a minor infection caused not only by bacteria, but also by hormonal imbalances, lack of vitamin D, excess of estrogen, and very high levels of consumption of gluten. Finally, bacteria can also affect our appetite. Bacteria make us crave certain foods. This theory is not as crazy as it may seem, because humans have been around for millions of years together with bacteria, and our choices on what to eat can be a matter of life and death for the bacteria. So it's quite likely that they indeed have adapted to influence our choices by making us feel certain cravings for certain foods. 
they reward us with signals that reach our brains when we eat foods that they like. Bacteria prefer foods that arrive to the large intestine without being completely digested, so they can really make the best out of it. When you eat candy or a slice of bread, the enzymes will be breaking down these food particles as part of the entire digestive process. As a result of that, your blood sugar levels will increase. And ideally, this is going to be a slow and gradual process. What you want to avoid is a sudden glucose peak in your blood. Our body will be releasing different hormones, such as insulin, as a reaction to the rise of the blood sugar level. One reason why we love candy and other sugary foods is because of the reward system that we have in our brains. This influx of energy will cause a feeling of pleasure. The problem is that never before in history, humans had so much access to sugar as we have now. And that is where many obesity problems are coming from. To start burning the fat in your belly, first you want to burn your glycogen stores. And that is why physiologists are saying that if you want to burn fat, you first have to do one hour of exercise just to be able to start burning the fat. The body likes to keep those fat reserves very well stored. Fat is a very valuable resource. Because of its structure, it can hold twice as much energy as carbohydrates or proteins. But fat is not just an energy storage for us. We can also use fat to create all types of uh, boosters for our nerves to be conducting electric impulses, also to create hormones in our body, and also in each one of our cells we have fat in our membranes. This means fat is a very important part to create our body. We just have to be aware about the difference from good fats and bad fats. Extra virgin olive oil, for example, can help us to be protected against atherosclerosis, Alzheimer, and eye diseases. It also seems to have some benefits against inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and against some types of cancer. Olive oil is also good for people with obesity because it will block an enzyme in the adipose tissue known as fatty acid synthase, which creates fat from carbohydrates. But just be careful about not using olive oil for frying because the heat can alter the chemical structure of the olive oil. For frying, maybe you would prefer lard, butter or coconut oil. Besides the sensitivity to high temperatures, the refined oils can also be capturing free radicals from the air. The theory says that these free radicals can be harmful to our body because they don't really enjoy being free radicals. They like to join themselves with other substances. So in our body, they can start to be attaching themselves to blood vessels, to skin, or nerves, and that will cause inflammation, pain, or even cancer. And that is why, for example, you can be sure to close your olive oil bottle and keep it in a fresh place. Let's take a look at the types of fats that we can find in different foods. Animal fats found in meat, milk, and eggs, they all contain arachidonic acid, which is used by our body to produce neurotransmitters involved in feeling pain. Now, the vegetable oils, such as canola, linseed, and hemp seed, they are all rich in an anti-inflammatory substance known as the alpha-linolenic acid. And olive oil contains a substance called oleocanthal. All of these substances, they act as a little bit like ibuprofen or aspirin, even though in a much smaller dose. They will not be effective to treat a severe headache, but may help to reduce pain in other cases such as menstrual cramps or moderate inflammations. The author also reminds us that a vegetarian diet must be followed carefully to avoid nutritional deficiencies, because the proteins found in plants are different from those found in meat. For example, beans do not provide us with enough methionine. Rice and wheat are not um, very good sources of lysine and corn is very poor in lysine and tryptophan. Because of that, vegans and vegetarians have to be making smart choices of foods to avoid malnutrition. It is important to have a varied diet. Not only it's going to be very delicious, but it's also going to be good for you. And different plants will have different combinations of amino acids, so you can be combining soybeans and quinoa and amaranth, spirulina, buckwheat and chia seeds. Tofu also has a reputation of being a good meat substitute. Allergies and intolerances. 
The explanation for certain food allergies can be found in the digestive process that is born in the small intestine. If the proteins are not broken down into their respective amino acids properly, there will be a little bit of a um, byproduct. In normal situations, these leftovers will not get into the bloodstream and there will be no problem. However, in some cases, some of these particles will enter the lymphatic system, attracting the attention of the immune system. So, when our immune cells find out that there is this trace of peanut that we ate, they may attack it as if it is an invader. And this can be getting worse every time we eat the same peanut again and again, because our immune system will be already prepared to be attacking and our reaction will be more and more aggressive. The reaction can become so extreme to the point that if you just put some peanut in your mouth and start munching, you already have all types of allergies, of a swollen face, swollen mouth, very unpleasant situation. And this could be a good explanation why um, we have some allergies to fat and protein combined foods such as milk, eggs and nuts. Now, let's talk about a topic that has been receiving a lot of attention in the media lately, and this is celiac disease and gluten sensitivity. Not all the allergies are developed in our small intestine related to foods that are rich in fats, because that's how they actually get into the lymphatic system. For example, shrimp, pollen and gluten, they are not fat rich foods. So we should find another theory to understand allergies. One theory is that the gastrointestinal walls can become temporarily more porous and then this would allow food particles to enter the intestine and go to the bloodstream. The research following this hypothesis is very new and people are still studying it a little bit more, particularly people who are interested in gluten. And what is gluten? Gluten is a protein found in wheat and other grains. And since grains cannot run away from predators or attack them, they developed a chemical protection to defend themselves from dangers. Some plants produce slightly venomous seeds. Wheat will need uh, their seeds to germinate, and they have a very small time frame for that. When an insect is eating those grains, they may start to feel a little bit sick because of the gluten contained in that wheat. And then next time they see a grain of wheat, they may choose not to eat it. In humans, Gluten can weaken the communication between the cells in the digestive tract and this could cause a partial absorption of the proteins contained in the wheat. This would increase the reaction of our immune system. One in every 100 people have a genetic intolerance to gluten. These are celiac people, that's the population that we have. But it can be said that the proportion of people who are gluten sensitive is much higher. What is the difference here? People who suffer from celiac disease, they just cannot eat anything with gluten. This can be very bad. They can have all types of intestinal problems, infections, problems in their nervous system. And people with celiac disease may also be having diarrhea and even children can be having problems developing. Gluten sensitivity is less visible. People who suffer from gluten sensitivity may be accumulating symptoms throughout the years without even noticing or linking those symptoms to gluten. For example, having stomach aches, anemia, problems with obesity, all types of situations that we described already in our video about the book Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis. Gluten sensitivity doesn't mean that you cannot ever eat anything containing gluten. You may eat one bread, one slice of cake here and there with moderation. However, removing gluten from your diet may have additional benefits, even if you're not sensitive to it. For example, if you're trying to lose weight, if you want to get rid of that exaggerated flatulence, if you want to increase your energy, if you want to reduce your headaches, improve the pain in your joints and become more concentrated or get rid of that acne, maybe if you get rid of the gluten foods from your diet, you will explore a new phase with more quality of life. This is all new and researchers are still trying to understand more about that. What we know, however, is that the people who are suffering from all these symptoms, they generally have an improvement when they stop eating gluten, even if they don't have celiac disease. Now, let's talk about lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance is not an allergy or a real case of intolerance. It is a deficiency. 
It's related to our difficulty to digest lactose. Lactose is a component of milk. It contains two sugar molecules that are linked by chemical bonds. And to break these bonds, your body will need a special enzyme. This enzyme is produced in your small intestine, breaking down lactose for its absorption. In about 75% of the world population, the genes that are responsible to break down this lactose will not be with you when you are an adult. Only in the United States, Australia and Western Europe, there will be more people who will be able to digest that lactose. But in most of the world, lactose tolerance in the adult life is something quite rare. However, this is normal because we only need milk during our infancy. And when we stop producing this enzyme, there will be problems very similar to gluten sensitivity, stomach aches, diarrhea, and flatulence. But differently from celiac disease or gluten intolerance, these milk particles will not enter the intestinal walls or get inside of our bloodstream. The lactose that has not been processed will just continue throughout our intestine and will be eaten by bacteria and become gas and discomfort. So, if you think about it, lactose intolerance has less risks to our health compared to celiac disease. So, if you are the type of person who really loves a little bit of milk and you happen to be lactose intolerant like most of the people, you don't really need to eliminate lactose forever from your diet. You can just be trying different quantities and see what is your tolerance level. Maybe you can even drink one glass of milk without any major problems and enjoy your ice cream. Each person is different. The greatest food intolerance in the Western world is fructose intolerance. Around 40% of the world population affected. Fructose intolerance is called by an inherited trait. It is genetical. It is the difficulty of our body to metabolize the sugars found in fruits because we have low levels of enzymes digesting that fructose. But in most cases, this um, fructose intolerance is not because of a genetic factor. It's just people who have a poor fructose absorption. Eating an apple per day will not be a problem for fructose intolerant people. It's okay, because the quantity is moderate. The problem is with processed foods like ketchups, sweetened yogurts, canned soups, because in these ones you have a very high amount of fructose. These foods, when they're consumed, they make the body feel very unable to react to this high level of fructose. The adult fructose intolerance is different from the hereditary genetic fructose intolerance. One possible explanation is that there are less GLUT5 transporters in the intestinal walls, so when people eat something containing fructose, these transporters will become overloaded, and then the fructose is not properly absorbed. Then what happens? The fructose continues going through our intestine, and guess what? Bacteria will start eating it, and we're going to have different types of discomforts. Fructose intolerance may also affect our humor. Tryptophan likes to be joining with fructose during digestion. So, when we are not able to digest fructose, we may also lose tryptophan. But Seichi, what is the problem about that? Well, tryptophan is involved in the production of serotonin, the hormone related to happiness. So, an unattended long-term fructose intolerance may lead to depression. This is also a new discovery and doctors are now trying to figure it out a little bit better. Serotonin is not only responsible for making us feel good, but also help us to feel satisfied after a meal. Feeling constantly hungry may be a collateral effect of fructose intolerance, especially if other symptoms such as stomach aches are present. Another hormone that makes us feel satisfied after eating is leptin. Foods containing high fructose corn syrup may suppress the effect of leptin and that will make us feeling very hungry. And be careful when you go to extremes, because maybe you are intolerant to a certain type of food, but that doesn't mean you have to be running away from it like it's poison or something like that. In most of the cases, you can just be more um, moderate in the consumption. Just do it with moderation, keep track of what you're eating, and as soon as you start feeling sick or weird, just stop. 
Through good information and professional support, of course, you can get a much better understanding of your body, your limitations, and what is the best diet for you. All of that will increase your quality of life. Dealing with nausea. We have already talked about the nausea caused when you are trying to read a book inside of a car. In these cases, the body thinks that you have been poisoned. But there are other situations in which you can have nausea. For example, emotional distress and anxiety. Under normal conditions, in the morning, your body will be producing CRF hormone. That's the corticotrophin releasing factor. And that will help you to be doing your daily tasks. This hormone will give you energy, will regulate your immune system, and also help your skin get tanned as a reaction to sunlight. The brain can also produce an additional dose of CRF and release it to your bloodstream if you're feeling particularly stressed. Now, how is that related to nausea and vomiting? CRF is not only synthesized in your brain, but also in the guts. So the production of this hormone is triggered by stress and fear. And when your brain is under stress, vomiting will make it um, get rid of the non-digested food and you will save a little bit of energy that you otherwise need to do the digestive process. That way is how your brain will be concentrated more to focus and solve whatever it is that is causing you to become stressed about. That is why some people say that, uh, especially some students, that they were feeling so anxious, nervous during the exam that they wanted to throw up. Some things that you can do to avoid fear-induced nausea are listening to music, sitting back, and doing relaxation techniques. All these activities will calm you down and will reduce your urge to throw up. There is also a spot in the body called P6, but the acupuncturists say that between your tendons, uh, around three or two fingers, you find a spot in which you can be pressing and that will reduce your nausea and anxiety. There are also some studies suggesting that ginger has positive effects in eliminating nausea by blocking the vomiting signal that is sent to your brain by your stomach. If you're not really sure what is the cause of your nausea, just trust your gut feeling. Don't make yourself throw up by putting your finger in your throat or drinking water with salt, because if your body needs to throw up, it will do it, trust me. In cases in which people are ingesting chemical products to be able to throw up, generally there will be more problems than benefits. Dealing with constipation. Some people determine if they are constipated or not by the number of times they go to the toilet, but you can tell if you are constipated or not by the quality of your time in the bathroom. So, if you're having a painful experience, or very difficult time, that means you have a problem. There are different types of constipation. A temporary constipation may happen because you are traveling, because you are sick, or because you are under a lot of stress. Now, a long-lasting constipation may be a sign of a chronic problem. The most important thing to be looking is to have enough fiber-rich foods. Fiber will not be digested by your small intestine, so it will be helpful to eliminate the feces. Some examples of fiber-rich foods are psyllium husk seeds and plums. In addition to fiber, they contain substances that keep your bowel moist and also will help everything to flow better. There are also some fiber tablets that you can buy in any pharmacy and 30 grams of tablets will be enough for one day. You should also pay attention to how much water you're drinking. Because if you are dehydrated, that can also make constipation worse. Some common causes of dehydration are doing exercise in days that are very hot or having very long flights and of course not drinking enough water. However, if you are already drinking the necessary quantity of water, drinking more water will not make a big difference. There is another myth that if you walk more, that will help you with the constipation problem. This is partially true, because if you are extremely sedentary, when you start moving a little bit to become normal and have an active life, it'll, it will have some benefits. However, if you already walk every day, if you have regular exercise, more exercise will not make you feeling better. If you are the type of person who doesn't like to go to public bathrooms, for example, if you are in a road trip, just don't hold it for too long, because uh, again, your body will lose a little bit of the synchrony. You're going to have uh, 
different type of signals and then it's going to make it more difficult for you to actually do it when you want. And in addition to that, the body will start to be absorbing water from your feces and also that will make things more difficult and more painful. As with any other health issue, it's important that you consult your doctors to be understanding what are the causes of that constipation and also make sure that this is not part of a larger problem. For example, diabetes and thyroid problems are two examples of diseases that you may want to check related to constipation. Use of probiotics. Different cultures around the world have their traditional plates depending on microbes. We're talking here about pickles, German sauerkraut, pretzels, the creme fraiche and uh, Swiss cheeses, the soy sauce, kimchi, kombucha, and so on. Fermentation is one of the oldest and healthiest ways to preserve food. Unfortunately, many industrial processes will be killing the good bacteria in these foods. For example, when you buy a jar of sauerkraut in the supermarket, that's coming from a factory and they boiled everything and they killed all the good bacteria in that process. Probiotic bacteria can also help to take care of our gut. They produce small quantities of fatty acids such as butyrate, which is very good for the intestinal villi. Therefore, there is a better capacity of nutrient absorption and a better protection against harmful substances. In addition to that, good bacteria take the space that would generally be occupied by harmful bacteria in our intestine. Good bacteria not only prevent constipation and diarrhea problems, but they also help our immune system. This can be something very good for people who are always getting sick. These helpful bacteria can also be found in dairy products like yogurt. So maybe one small pot of yogurt per day can make a big difference for you. There is one limitation to the efficacy of all the current probiotics that we take. is because they are isolated species of bacteria bred in the lab. So as soon as we stop taking them, basically they disappear from our bowels. Each gut is different containing different types of bacteria that interact, helping each other, attacking each other. And when new bacteria appear because we ate something different, they generally don't stay there permanently. So when you stop consuming them, the positive effects tend to disappear. The great potential of probiotics can be seen in the case of bacteria transplants to the intestine. And that is a way that they can grow and live permanently. Let's now talk about prebiotics. Prebiotics are foods that will help the good bacteria to grow and thrive and reproduce, but they can only help if we already have those good bacteria in our guts. They can be found in vegetables like leek, asparagus, onions, garlic, endive, artichoke, and resistant starches. Resistant starch is formed when you cook rice or potato and then you let it cool down. This way, the starch will be crystallizing and becomes more resistant to the digestion. Some of the good prebiotic dishes are potato salad and cold sushi. And you can also have some prebiotic uh, tablets from the pharmacy. Well, this is a big and fascinating topic. There is so much more that we could be talking about this. But for this video, we took the aspects that we consider to be the most interesting and useful. If you wish to go and buy the original book, you can see the link here on the screen. And we're going to keep making videos exploring this topic here in Natugut. And I ask you, what subjects would you like to see in our next videos? Maybe bacteria and obesity, prebiotics, probiotics, the helicobacter pylori, composition of our gut flora, constipation, the quality of the feces, inflammation, irritable bowel syndrome, the cravings that we have for certain foods because of our bacteria, salmonella, toxoplasmosis, the hygiene in our kitchen, the daily cleaning. I don't know. As you can see, we have a long list of topics and your suggestions are always welcome. The Not Too Good initiative believes in quality of information and education as a starting point to have better conscious decisions. Of course, always in collaboration with the health professionals. To make sure that you receive our next materials, subscribe to our YouTube channel and also visit our site to see our email list and get exclusive materials.